What might your name be? Teresa Jemison. Nice to meet you. It's nice meeting you. What was your occupation? In some ways, I a little bit of everything. I was a, a housekeeper, housewife, I guess. I didn't work. I did everything else at home, and outside, inside. I drove my husband around on his job, so I was also a chauffeur. Could you tell me what um, reservation you lived on? Well, I was born on the St. Richard's Mohawk Reservation, which is in Hogansburg, New York. It's in Franklin County, the northernmost county in New York State. It butts up to Quebec. How many reservations have you lived on in the past? Probably just these two. The St. Richard's Mohawk and the Tonawanda, where I live now. Yes, would you like to tell us about the St. Regis Mohawk, you said, was the name of the other reservation? Mm -hmm. Could you tell us about that reservation? How long well, were you there? Well, I was born there in November 11, 1918. And I moved away from there when I was about three years old. And we moved to Messina, New York. And I started to school in Messina in kindergarten, and we lived there until 1930, March 1930, when, well, because of the Depression. And uh, my mother had a boarding house, and then there was no work, so we, there was no boarders, so we moved back to the reservation. And I lived there for, I was there, well, till 1932, and then I had a cousin, distant cousin, who worked in Greenwich, Connecticut for the wealthy people. And she came home to visit, and she told me about the place. And I guess being young and wanted to see other places, and I, she said that she could find a job for me, and I could take care of the, uh, the wealthy people's children. And I talked my mother into letting me go. I was only 14, and I went, and I worked there two years. I guess maybe it was foolish, but I also learned an awful lot uh, that I never would have learned if I had stayed to home. Like, what did you learn? Oh, I guess learned a lot of things about manners, uh, learned how the, you know, the, the rich people eat differently. They, they have people wait on them, and, and, and I had to use, had to think when I said something because I was taking care of the two children. And I got to see New York City, got to see different places in Connecticut when they would, we would go for a ride, the people I worked for. And they were very nice people. And uh, then in two years I was there, then I came home, and I went back to school. And, and at that time, because I hadn't, I hadn't completed eighth grade, I had like two subjects. So I had to go for the whole year and just take two subjects till I, when I, when I finished the, you know, it was math, math and English, I guess. And uh, then I went to high school. And I went to high school in Bombay, New York. And then in 1937, I had a chance to go to a summer camp and I, but first, they had an Indian training camp for young people, and it was through the NYA, which was really the National Youth Administration, and it was to help young people to be able to earn money because there was no work at that time for parents. 
the fathers and so I uh, and I went to summer camp. I was a counselor in a Girl Scout camp in Wallkill, New York for two summers. Did you say that was an Indian camp? Well, no, I, I went to the training camp in Wallkill, uh, in, I guess it was around Glens Falls, and it was for, I think, I don't know, 10 days, I think we had the camp. And then and they had all the young, uh, young people come there and uh, those that wanted to. And, uh, and we, we, we trained for the different things that, we, well, that you have to do when you go to camp. And, and then we were, well, we were called Indian counselors. So we were supposed to do, sh show the, the children and work with them with Indian things. And, but then because we had never been to camp, we had to learn how to do things. And uh, I, well, the thing, I guess, that I knew because I spoke Mohawk, because, uh, and I still speak it. And, uh, and my mother and my grandmother made baskets, uh, and all the ladies did. So I knew, I watched, and I knew how they made baskets. So I had to teach basketry, but I never made a basket myself, but I could teach it. And, and I was there for two summers. And when I went to the Indian training camp, and that is where I met the man who was later my husband, uh, the, the, Mr. Jemison. And, and, he, and Edmund, my husband Edmund, who has been gone 34 years now, graduated from Akron High School in 1935. Was he an Indian counselor also? Yes, but he was in New Jersey. Uh, you know, he, he went to New Jersey as a counselor. But you met at the camp, though. Yeah, mm -hmm. but, he, but he was going to Cornell at the time. And so I then, well, after the two summer, well then in the fall, I instead of going home, my sister was working in Syracuse. She had gotten a job. Some little plants were, little factories were opening up. So she asked me to stay with her and I could go to school. So I stayed with her and, and we got a, a very small place for the two of us. And I went to school and then I, and I also got a job cooking for an elderly man. Where did you go to school? I went to Blodgett Vocational High School in Syracuse, New York. And, uh, and what course did you take there? Well, just right, started off to high school there, you know, and, uh, and, I, and I had taken, uh, well, I guess I, at the time uh, they had just brought in uh, typing and, you know, and, uh, in the, in the, at Bombay when I was going to Bombay. And uh, well, I, I, I guess I figured uh, I wouldn't be going to college, so if I learned to, you know, do, to, to, you know, we learned about filing and bookkeeping and stuff. And, uh, and then after camp, well, about 1939, I guess it was, and I, I, dropped, out, I dropped out of school and went back to back to, to, you know, to my hometown, to my, my home. And, and then to the then, reservation? Yeah. To, uh, and while I was at camp, and I was at a counselor in a Girl Scout camp, and it was called Camp, camp Wendy in Ulster County. Um, and I was invited by someone from the NYA uh, to go to um, some kind of a meeting. And uh, so one of, the, one of the counselors that was not on duty uh, said she could go, she, she, they said I could take somebody. So she went with me. I can't even, I can't remember her name. And, uh, and, and we went with him and, and then on the way he told me that we were going to appear at Vassar College that evening and it was, and that's when the president of Eleanor Roosevelt 
was, had started the World Youth um, Committee. It was a large group, but they were all, all from all over the world, young people. And uh, so what, the reason why they got me out of the camp was to participate in the Indian program. And, well, I never could Indian dance. And they, and they told me that we were to Indian dance up on the stage in front of Eleanor Roosevelt. And they were teaching me how to dance outside in about 10 or 15 minutes I had. And well, when I got up there, I closed my eyes so I wouldn't see the people watching me because I, <laughs> I and, well, I, I, I was so glad when it was, it was over. But, but, but the thing was, we could watch all the young people from all the different countries put on their program. And, uh, and that, you know, that was really interesting, too. You know, this was all young people from all over the world. And, and when, when it was over, and, well, I started to walk, walk toward the front door, and it was a very large building. And this man that had brought me came, dashed over and he said, come on. He said, well, I, want to, I want you to go. And well, I left my friend and I, so I went with him. We went out and, and we ran and he, was, he said, run, run. So we were running and I kept thinking, where's he taking me? I, you know, I'm running with him and, I'm, and I don't know where we're going and I don't really know him. But, so, and, and the building was a long building. And, um, and, you know, if anybody's been to Vassar College, they probably would know what I'm talking about. And, uh, and when we got to the back, and, and then there was a little a carb in the trees. <coughs> Excuse me. We went over there, and he said, I want you to meet Eleanor Roosevelt. Oh, my goodness. And, uh, and she was sitting in, and she used to have a little, little, little coop. And, and it was kind of high, but it was just, you know, like for two people. And, uh, so, and, and then they had one other young Indian fellow there. And he was also from my reservation. And uh, so he, we uh, met her. She shook hands. She sat in the car and she shook hands with us and get, talked to us real nice. Well, and, and then, well, you know, she didn't stay that long. But, and, uh, well, I couldn't believe that, you know, all of a sudden I had met her and then, then she took, you know, she left. Well, we had gone out the back door and all the people were at the front door waiting for her, but she, <laughs> she had left. And so the, when the lady, that young lady that came with me, you know, when I found her again and I, and she said, where did you go? And I said, I met Elmer Roosevelt. I, she shook my hand and she, and she, so she was shaking my hand, and uh, she said, "Well, I'll shake the hand that shook the hand of Eleanor Roosevelt." <coughs> That's Excuse wonderful! Me. What a wonderful story! And, and well, um, the the two summers I spent as a counselor in a Girl Scout camp uh, were two of the wonderful best years of my my life because I. I did a lot. I met a lot of a lot of nice young. Well, most of them were college girls and, and school teachers, all young young women. And uh, well, then after, when I went home, and then later on, uh, well, I got married, and I guess I got married at I know sometime in 1940. Sometimes I get my years mixed up. Mm -hmm. It's, okay. it's kind of a long time ago, and uh, and I. Then I had children, and I had a, we, well, with our first son, and then my husband and I moved to Rochester. Where were you living when you got married? Well, in Hogansburg. On the reservation, yeah. the mm -hmm. Mohawk reservation. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> and uh, but then we moved to Rochester when I my little boy was oh a few months old, and we were there. You know, and I married my, because that was my first husband, and he was from my reservation. And we moved, when, after we moved to Rochester, and he was a st structural steel worker, 
in the, uh, they built bridges and, and skyscrapers, you know, uh, and uh, we were there, well, we were married, I guess, five years, and, uh, but it was not a, and I had four children, and my, I was, it was not a good marriage, so I was divorced. And then in 1946, and then, and then my son, son died in 1947. He, my little boy drowned. And, the, and, well, and then I, it was after, it was in 48 that I married Ed, Mr. Jemison. How did you find Mr. Jemison again? Well, you, it was after he came back from the from being a prisoner of war of the Japanese. He was a prisoner of war for 39 months. He was captured on Corregidor. And, uh, and it was, well, we were married two years after he, he came back. And it was, I guess it was just fate that, that our paths crossed again. Where did you meet him? Uh, well, I didn't meet him right away. I got a letter from my sister telling me that he had been a prisoner of war, and I didn't know this because I never, never heard from him after, you know, after he, he went in the service in 1939. And, uh, and, and it was because I got the letter from my sister, and I told, I, I sat down, and the only address I had of him was Basin, New York. And uh, there was no, no, no zip codes in those days, nothing, just based in New York. And I felt so bad when I, when, I, when I read the letter that my sister wrote telling me that he had been a prisoner of war. And I never, never thought of him. I knew he was in the Philippines, but that was it. I, never, you know, I, had, I raised a family and I wasn't thinking about, I was just thinking about my family. And I, and so I sat down and I wrote a letter and I had, don't, had no idea if he was married, if he had a family, I didn't know. But I just wanted to tell him that, that how sorry I was that, that he had been a prisoner. And, and, and all, the lady that told my sister told her that he, was, he had lost a leg. And so I figured he was crippled. And uh, so in my letter, I, you know, told him how sorry I was that he had lost a leg, and that he had been a prisoner, and uh, and and I just on my letter, like I always say to people, if you're ever anywhere near Rochester, I said, stop in and meet my family. And uh, and and he answered my letter. I not which I didn't think he would. I I get a hear anything. And, uh, and, and when he wrote, and he told me that he didn't lose a leg, but his eyesight, uh, he was considered blind by the, you know, by the ar army. And, uh, that was something that happened when he was a prisoner of yeah, war? Yeah, the malnutrition, uh, you know, the, they didn't have the right food. And, uh, and, and it, was, well, it was through that that we, we met, you know, met again. And then after I was divorced, and then he asked me to marry him, and he told me that he would take my children and ra raise them. But he was going to go back to college, and he did. We, we got married, and we, he went back to college. He went to UB, and we moved to Buffalo. And then w when he finished, we moved out to Basem. And How did he do college if he was almost legally blind? That's amazing. Well, the the veteran the veterans back in the Second World War had a lot of uh, help, and uh, they had readers. And then there was times when I read for him, and they and I got paid for reading for him. And uh, what course did he take in college? Well, he he took business administration, but but then after he was through. Uh, he had a hard time finding a job because in those days a blind person was considered a risk and 
the, he was hired in all the, the places he went, but the insurance wouldn't cover him, so they couldn't, he, he couldn't get the job. And then around 1951 or 52, I can't remember just when, he, um, after we had moved out here, we moved, in, we moved October 15th, 1950, to the reservation, to the Tonawanda Reservation. And then I think it was about 1951 that he, had, he was asked to come and to Batavia that they needed a caseworker, but he didn't, he didn't, he didn't want to take the job because he, he couldn't drive and a caseworker has to drive. And I told him if he, he could take the job and I would drive. And well, he still didn't think that, you know, because we had my the youngest, my son Dwight, who also graduated from Akron, was not in school yet. And I said, well, I'll, I'll take him with us and we can sit in the car while you visit the people you have to visit. And this is what I, what I did. I, I drove and, and took him, Dwight. And then when Dwight, Dwight had started to school and all he had, he was going to, the, the, and back then, in 1951, 52, I guess it was, they, they, they had so many children uh, going, starting just kindergarten. I think they said at that time they had the largest and they didn't have the room, so half of it was at the basement of the De Niro Library. library yeah. and, and this is where Dwight started to school. And uh, well, there was, I, when when I if I when he was going in, in the morning, I could take him in the afternoon. But then when he went in the afternoon, it was the, when it was reversed because they used to reverse the. And uh, well, then I had to find somebody to stay with him, and uh, and I would drive my husband around. And well, the children grew up and. and you know, well, they all graduated. My daughter Valerie was was the oldest, and then my son An Andrew, and my son Dwight, and they all graduated from Akron. Was and Edmund um, was he a native for the Tonawanda Reservation? Yes, he was yes. born and raised there. Yeah, mm -hmm. the, and uh, and now, do your children still live on the Tonawanda Reservation? Uh, just Andrew. Uh, Valerie lives in Louisiana. And and her children, you know, some of her children are there, and some have moved back. Two uh, two of them live on on the Tonawanda Reservation, and, and then my son Andrew and his wife Elizabeth and Elizabeth teaches school in Pem Pembroke, and and my son Dwight uh, lives in Binghamton, New York. And he taught at Endicott Union High School. He was an industrial arts teacher, and he retired last June. He from, retired uh, already <laughs> from teaching. I think of and, him as my age. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I couldn't believe that thirty years went by so fast. And I. What other people do you have on your list, Ashley? What other people have you met? Met. Uh, well, I. The people that I. I. I didn't. I didn't get to talk to President Jimmy Carter, but I. Uh, shook hands with him because, I and it was in Rome, Italy. And it was at the Vatican, and we we met. We we were all presented. So we, I shook hands with President Carter and Mrs. Carter and Amy Carter, and and there was quite a few of his cabinet with him, and so I shook hands with all of them too. What were you all doing in Rome, Italy? I I went there because of the beatification of a, a Mohawk girl that we're, we are praying for to become a saint. 
and that was the year that she was beatified by the Pope. Could you tell us about her? Well, she was born somewhere around Fonda and Orisville, and she was half Mohawk and half Algonquin. And and back in those days, well, the, the missionaries had been coming over from France, and the, it was the Jesuits, and and some of the Indian people had a uh, were had converted, and and she wanted to convert, and her and she was an orphan. She lived with her uncle and and her aunt, and they didn't want her to be to convert to Catholicism, and but that's what she wanted. So some of the, those that had already converted helped her to run away, and she ran away from there and went to way, way up beyond Montreal, and they walked, you know, from, and, uh, and then and she was, I think, uh, she died when she was about 21. She was, she was young when she died. But she had, they, that was why she ran away, because she didn't want to marry. And she, well, I guess if she had lived longer, she probably would have become a nun, because they've always, in, in the readings that I've done of her. And, uh, but it was because of her that I got to see Rome, Italy. And, and I have tra I've been going to, the different states in the United States uh, almost every year when, when they have conferences and it's all on her. It's, it's the prayers are to, you know, to, for her to gain sainthood. What is her name? Her, her Indian name is Kaderi Tekakuita. That's beautiful. And what and, does that mean? Well, Kaderi is Catherine. That's how they, you know, they say Catherine in Mohawk, and and I think it's a lot of the names are because you would probably say in in French they would probably make it sound like Catherine, and then and and then in Mohawk you don't have a I N E, you know, and so it's Kadeli, and that's like my Indian name because my name is Teresa, so. I was always said my my mother and everyone called me Deleuze, and again that's from the French Therese, and it, so they changed it to Deleuze. And, and what um, did Catherine do that would make her a saint? She has to do one miracle because she's everything else she's passed, but she needs to do one miracle. Did she do a miracle? Not yet. That's why she's not a saint yet. Oh, she's still alive? No. No. You, no, you, you, they don't make you a saint when you're alive. You, I didn't you, think so. Yeah. yeah. No, oh, no, she died in the 1700s because she was born in the 1600s. Oh. So she, but we're, we're, we keep hoping, we keep hoping that the, you know, the Pope would make her a saint. So you're hoping to find out that she did perform a miracle somewhere? Well, we will, you know, we will all know when she does, you know, because everybody keeps in touch with, you know, each other. And, uh, and then I, I, my, my daughter works in a, well, she, she works in a post office in Hammond, Louisiana. And a few years back, I, I went to visit, and she told me, she said, that Carol O'Connor was making the, the, movie, the movie, the TV movie that, in the heat of the night, was being made at her post office. But it would, they would do it after, you know, after the people had gone home. And, and all of the, 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 in the when the, when the scenes were done, it was on the outside of the post office, and and she had met Mrs. O'Connor, and when she told 
Mrs. O'Connor that I was coming down to visit her. Mrs. O'Connor said, well, you, could tell, you call me as soon as your mother gets here so that I can meet her. So we, 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 we called her and then she told us to come to the motel where they were staying. And we went there and, and met, you know, first we met her, but he, he was busy writing because he, he wrote all the, the, all the um, story of the, the, in the heat of the night. I didn't realize he wrote yeah, that. Yeah, he, 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 and, and this is what, he, so she said he'll be down in a little while. And uh, well then when he came down, and uh, so she introduced us to him, and, and he was just like p people I know. He, he was so friendly, and, and then other people, when they saw him, came up to him, and you know, they, here is you know, Carol O'Connor, and, uh, and, and but every time somebody came over, and then he would introduce us to the people that, and he'd say, and, he's, um, and this is my friend, Teresa Jemison, you know, and uh, so, we, and, I, and we, my daughter and I, you know, laughed about it because we thought they were probably wondering who in the world are they. <laughs> and and then they took us out to dinner. We went out to dinner with them. And when we, my daughter and I were going home, and I said, I can't believe that I was, I ate with Carol O'Connor, and and I was talking with him, talking to him, I, as if I'd known him all my life. That's and, exciting. Can you tell the kids who Carol O'Connor played on television? Well, well, he he played two different things. He was on first. It was the, um, all in the family. All you know? in the family. The, the Archie Bunker. You know, everybody knows him as Archie Bunker, and then so you know, and 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 when his son passed away, well, years later, I sent them. He and Mrs. Connor, O'Connor. I sent them a, a sympathy card. And he wrote a nice letter back to me, all by hand. Do you, you know? have the letter still? Uh, he, yes, some, oh. some with all my papers. What a treasure. And, and, uh, and they gave me their address and their telephone number and told me to, if I ever came to Los Angeles to call them. And, 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 oh, cool. and, so now you'll and, have to go just so you can go visit them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, when, uh, when, he, when he passed away and I sent her a um, you know, um, a sympathy card too, Aww. and then I, I, Joe Campanella. Um, oh, you'll have to explain to the yeah. Who is who is Joe? Well, well he, he's an he's an actor and he's played a long time. What did he play? Uh, oh, I can't. Be. Well, the time that I met, and I had to ch follow him, but all these people I always forget to ask for their autograph. You know when I. And when I, and my daughter told him, she, oh, no, it wasn't my daughter. Whoever I was with said, there's that actor. And I looked and it was him and he was walking by with his wife and, and, and he was carrying a little child. Well, and, and they kept, and I said, oh, I, I wish I could meet him. They said, well, go, go to, uh, up to him. Well, then they kept walking and I was following them and finally they stopped and I, so I, Went over to him, and I told you know I told him who I was and the reason why I was wanted to shake hands with him because I said you were on my soap opera, but I can't remember what soap opera it is. <laughs> but he and and so I shook hands with him and he and he laughed. He said, "You remember that when I was on that soap opera?" And I said, "Yes." But he he plays on something now that on one of the night shows, uh, but he has a small part, you know. Uh, and uh, but so I, and I, you know, and I just thought that was wonderful that I met him. And then I also met Ethel Kennedy. Uh, and this was again back in the, I think it was in the 70s. No, uh, it has to be before, no, it was in the 60s because it was before my husband died. And we, we went to, I think they were opening a small factory in on the on the Cattaraugus Seneca Reservation, and uh, and they and uh, Robert Kennedy 
was going to be the speaker there. And, uh, and, and, my, and the job that my husband had now, as years had passed, he was the social worker for the whole state of New, of, uh, New York State. Wow. Uh, he was over all the, uh, the, the Indi Indians. On, uh, so, so he had to be there. And so we, when, when we were there, well, everybody surrounded Robert Kennedy. So, and I did, I, well, there was no reason for me to be up. And I looked and I saw Ethel Kennedy way back all by herself. Nobody was talking to her, nobody was walking. So I wa walked back over there. So I walked with her and talked with her. And you know, so, but I, my husband got a picture of a, a little snapshot uh, with, you know, with, uh, and I, ha I did have a picture of, of Robert Kennedy and, uh, and a, a picture of Ethel and I sent it to them one time, but I never heard from anyone. But I, you know, I, uh, Do you still I, have the picture of you walking with Ethel? I, no, well, I didn't get a picture of, because I was walking with her. Oh, I thought you yeah. said your husband took a picture no, of you No, he, he got a picture of Robert Kennedy in the, in the, with the, you know, in the group. Okay. But, uh, but uh, I, you know, and again, I didn't think to get her autograph. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I, uh, Oh, I, I, met, I met two other actors. I also met the, one, the man that used to be on, uh, was it Dallas? The one that was always fighting with uh, um, J. With J.R.? J.R. Remember, remember he, he, he had been married to, to J.R.'s wife, the lady that played you know, J.R.'s wife. She had been married to him before. And he was real, s s kind of a fresh-sounding fellow, and I can't think of his name. I but can't either. I, but I met him in in Louisiana, in 1985 at the World's World's Fair. It was you know the, they had it in Louisiana, and uh, and I did get his his autograph, and he wrote it on, and, I, and I've got the thing put away, but you know he wrote his name on it, and I also met another man one time. And I, I know I got his autograph and I think his picture, but he, when they used to have the Beverly Hillbillies, there, there was a, an, an older man that used to come on and he, he, was, he was like the medicine man. And he was, a, you know, like he looked like a, an old country hick. He was real thin and, and he would come and just played the part of a, but he always talked about herbs and stuff and uh, and I got I got his autograph too but I as I say I have so, I, I, I saved so many papers and and things that I uh, and well I guess uh, you know what was his name oh uh, like I I can't re I can't remember his name okay. and uh, and I, I always think I wish I could uh, see that movie over again to you know uh, but maybe one day I'll come across his, <laughs> come across the little, uh, I know it was a little booklet telling him, I think he and his wife, I think he said that they had a little shop and they, and they sold, um, you know, a lot of um, natural things. And, uh, you know, and, uh, but he, you know, I was just surprised when I saw him and they, but they, they told it at the, I'm trying to think, where I think it might, might have been at the. I I'm trying to think, is in the different states I have traveled in, and you know, and, and, and I think this is somewhere that I had, uh, you know, met, met him. And, and uh, well, um, I, I said I I guess I've always been always thought that I was kind of special because, I was born, you know on November 11th, 1918. And, and I had asked my mother the one time, I said, what time was I born? And she said, just when the church bells were ringing and that the war was, you know, was over and they were, and because the, back in 1918, they did not have telephones where I lived. They didn't, 
but the church bells, they used to use church bells for a lot of things. Uh, when somebody died, you know, and, and I, my, my, one time I, my, my grandmother and I were standing outside and I could hear the church bells and we lived about four and a half miles from the church. And, uh, and I said, and my, and my grandmother stood there quiet and, and she, you know, and then all of a sudden she said, there was a, an older lady that died. And I looked at her and I said, how do you know? You know and, she, and she, then she told me that they had a certain way of whatever age the person was that died, they, that's how many times the, the bell, you know, the strokes of the bell. And, uh, and then there's a certain way they would do it if it was a man or a woman. And, you know, well, I, so they had a method of, you know, how you found out something was happening, you wow. know, uh, through, through, through the church. And, and I guess, you know, and I never dreamed I would live this long to have, well, I, you know, as I say, I had four children, but I, three, three of my children are alive, and I have eight grandchildren, and I have, tw I think it's 12 great-grandchildren. I'm not and, sure if these kids would know. Could you explain to them what Armistice Day is? Um, well, today, they, November 11th, you always hear them now say it's Veterans Day. But originally, it was supposed to have been Armistice Day because that's what they called it until just a few years ago when they decided to make the veteran uh, instead to bring in all the the different wars and the veterans, and uh, so they, I guess the word Armistice was they had to, you know signed a treaty, and uh, but uh, a treaty for what? I bet they don't know the end of the war. Yeah. Well, that was 1918. Yeah. Oh, yeah. One. Yeah. The, uh, World War One. I'm yeah. thinking World War Two already. Yeah, World War One. And uh, but it, and, and but I still, I refuse to call it Veterans Day. I always say I was born on Armistice Day, and because that's the day I was born. I. So you would I, have to think of yourself <coughs> as a special child of peace. Yeah, yeah, I, I guess so. You were born so. on yeah. a day where they declared peace. Yeah. Oh, and, uh, wow. But, uh, and, and, well, I, you know, I, I, I was a little, young little girl during the, the 20s, the 1920s, and I guess the thing I can t tell you is that that's when the Charleston, the dance Charleston came out, oh, yeah. and that was the Roaring, tw oh. roaring Twenties, and, uh, and I, now I used to do the Charleston, but I never could Indian dance. <laughs> and, and and I, and then the Depression came. Uh, I lived through that. Where did you live during the Depression, and did you feel uh, it? Uh, well, I lived in Hogansburg, and then Syracuse. You know, when I was going to school, and then well, then the the Depression. Was easing off around 1939, and you know, and some plants were opening up, and but, and that, and I think they had just were just starting to get going again. But I, I can't remember that that because us young people weren't paying attention that somewhere off in Europe there was problems were going on, and. Uh, and, and that and, and Hitler was, you know, we were just busy trying to live, not, you know, not to be thinking about Europe. And uh, and then, well, in 1941, I was living in Rochester when, uh, and I, you know, and I, I can remember when President Roosevelt spoke on the radio and told us that the Japanese had and you know, bombed Pearl Harbor, and and at the same and, and when they bombed Pearl Harbor, and they and on their way back and they bombed, they they you know bombed uh, the Philippines, but, and that and that's where my my 
later he became my husband, but that's where he was at the time. And uh, so it's been um, oh, I, I, there's times because I didn't go to college, I thought that I um, I missed something that I. I did, uh, I did finish high school here in Akron in 1958. I had in my, because I went to my 12th year and I, so I, when I, um, they had adult education and I took my, um, I can't think of what they called it, uh, you, you could get your, uh, an equivalency? Yeah. And uh, it was in 1958. And, uh, and there was a, a, a lot of um, people that were like me that, you know, uh, hadn't finished, complete, they hadn't fi completed their, so, so we got our equivalency. And we, so I, I did finish high school. Wonderful. And, uh, Okay, Ashley, do you have more questions, honey? Um, what historical event impacted your life most? Oh, there have been, there, ha there have been so many because I, I guess, you know, the, the Second World War, my living, living through that, um, and, and then, uh, then, then my, then Vietnam came, and I had two sons that were in Vietnam. Well, once the in in at that time, but D Dwight went to Vietnam, and uh, but and and my son Andy was in uh, because they they stopped sending two brothers to the same uh, section because of the Sull Sullivan brothers that. The five were on the same ship, and they all died together back during the during the Second World War, and uh, so they they didn't send Andy to Vietnam, but but he, he stayed in, in around the Washington area and and taught because he taught health and nutrition in the in the service, and but, but I and, and I guess what. The, the, the dropping of the bomb at Hiroshima uh, was something else too that was big, and and I guess um, seeing this when when uh, air, air, during 1927 when I was young girl yet uh, when Lindbergh crossed the you know Charles Lindbergh crossed the ocean and you know went went to well, that was on the news, you know. But see, we all we got all our news either on the newspaper, or you went to the movies, and then and the newsreels gave us all our uh, our news of the. So, and back then, I went to the movies every dime I got because it only cost ten cents, and I went to see the movies. So, somebody gave me ten cents for doing the Charleston and. And I had money to. <laughs> it's, it's, it's you know, it's children of today don't. They just can't see you know. But but in some ways, the people that's my age, our childhood was we didn't have the things that that's around today, and uh, so I I can remember when a lady down the street from us got a radio and you could only I think only play that night and my mother and I went to visit her and and they turned it on and and this voice was coming out of this box and and I well, you know that was we never heard that mm -hmm. and so I waited till they all went in the kitchen and I stood there in in front of this great big uh, you know like a horn and I stood there, and I was talking back in there, and I was wondering if they could hear me. It's and then you know, then then the ra you know, then radio. Well, it was radio, and 
Before that, we had Victrolas. So, you know, you, you, you could play the records, you know, and uh, yeah, you, 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 know, you, you had to wind it up. <laughs> and I have, I have a Victrola, and every once in a while I play it for, for somebody, and, you know, the, and so I've, you know, almost, and, well, and then in um, 1973, wait, yes, 1973, I met Ransom Eckerson, and I worked for him for almost four, 14 years, and, and that was John Eckerson's father. And that's how we got to know the Eckersons. And a lovely family, correct? Y yes. <laughs> <laughs> and and well, I always I always tell people that I felt like they became my family. Uh, he was the best person that anybody could uh, you know meet. And I said I cooked for for him, and then I then finally I was cooking for the three of them, his two sons. And and I always said, you didn't have to be a real cook because they liked everything. So no matter what I cooked, they said it was good. <laughs> That's and, an Eckerson <laughs> trait. And I like to say I follow. <laughs> and 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 then and I learned a lot from him too because I used when I would get through with the put the dishes in the dishwasher, you know and that was different because we didn't have dishwashers. When, you know when. You know, when I was a, a young girl, and uh, so I would sit in the front room and visit with him, and then so then he would tell me things about when he was a boy, and uh, I would love to hear those things someday. The, the, it's it's oh gosh, you know how I wish I had thought you know back then to have you know gotten a tape recorder and and had him because he was always telling me things you know. And, uh, and then, and that's been my life, and that's to you know learn, uh, learn. I enjoy having somebody tell me things, and uh, and and then in 1971. Uh, now I did it before the the movie Roots came out, and that was you know I did my genealogy, uh, and. In 19, well, probably most of my my growing up life, I used to hear people talk about ancestors, and they would talk about reading something their ancestor had written, and and it used to make me feel bad that, you know, well, my mother didn't write, and my grandmother they didn't go to school, they did, they only spoke Mohawk, and so I just. And, and they were they died in 1949 and 1950, and I thought, well, I guess I could I'll never know anything about my ancestors because they they were they were gone. And in 1971, I was visiting my sister up Hogansburg, and I was riding down the road the one day all by myself. And, and again, it came to my mind that I wish there was some way that I could find out things going way back. And then I, then all of a sudden, I thought of the church where I was baptized, and I th wondered if they, if I could find out anything there. So I drove, and it's in Saint Regis, Quebec, but I just, just went, you know, drove across the line and went to the church, and I. I rapped at the door, and the priest came to the door, and, and he said, anything I can help you with? And I said, well, I came to find out how far back could I go in, in, you know, in my family, because I said, he said, is there a reason you want to do this? And I said, no, but just that I want to do it. And I wondered, how far back could I go? And he said, well, sometimes you can go far back, and sometimes you may only go back two, two generations. And, and he said, well, he said, I don't have any time today, because it was late in the afternoon when I went there, but he said, I have one hour in the morning at 9 o'clock from 9 to 10. So he said, if you want to come back, I said, I'll be back. 
And well, I was back before he was even ready, rapping at his door again. And so he, he, he asked me my father's Indian name. Well, my father died when I was seven years old. And I knew his name in English, but you know, you don't call your father by his name. You know, when we said it, we would say Baba. You know, it's like Papa. And, uh, but I know my mother used to tell me what his name, Indian name was, but I never used it, so I, the, you know, when he asked me, I just couldn't think of it. And I said, well, my brother goes to church here. And I said, and, and, and I know his Indian name. So when I told him, he said, oh, I know him. So he, um, and he went and, and he got this, in this big old black safe that looks like the ones that they must have came, was made in the 1700s. And, and he got a book out and he put it on the desk and, and he said, he looked up and he, there, you know, he found where my, where my brother's name and then he said my father's name. I said, yeah, that's it. And uh, so, so he, he got, gave me a sheet of paper and he said, well, we'll see you know, what we can find out. So he said, and he had to translate it because the missionaries wrote it in French and Indian. He said, and then I'll translate it into English. And he said, so he said, you write down when I tell you. So I wait, start, you know, waited for him and he started with, with me, then my father, and then his father, and his father and mother. And, and we just kept going back and going back. And you know, all of a sudden we were in the 1800s, and we just were going back, and and, and got into the 1700s, and, and and then and then twice, well, he was he would tell me what to write, and he told me the names of the people, but it was all in Indian, and I so I wrote, wrote everything down, and then then there was uh, I think it was somewhere in the later 1800s that. One of my aunt's great grandfather had died, and there was a lot of people that came to his funeral that were, and I, and I, well, you know, people always go to funerals, but this was in there because it was a lot of white people. You know, they're always we always call them white people. They're not, you know, they're non non Indians, and uh, so and I wrote that down that. You know, and then, then, and then at an, another great grandfather, and, and it was written in the in there that that he he had a, a, a well the priest said in French it's like he had a master master voice that he he said he must have had a, a beautiful voice that he sang in you know in, in well, would be in church and. Uh, and I said, I wonder where it went. It sure, I sure didn't get it. <laughs> and, uh, and and then we went back, and he was, and I kept writing and writing, and I'm, you know, and my heart is going thump, 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 yeah. because I'm now we're in the 1700s, and, and then we got to the early 1700s, and then he wrote read a little, this little, another little story that was in there, and it, and it said in there that. The, the, no, the, that would have been the, my great, 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 I don't know if it's four greats, grandmother was the daughter of Silas Rice, who was captured by the Kaknawagas in 1703 in Marlboro, Massachusetts. Wow. And, well, I had never heard that. And Silas Rice it, was a white man. Yeah, you know, he was there. There was there were children in the in the colonial days, in this, you know, because he was born in the 1600s. <coughs> and well, you know, well, I you know, I'm I'm already on cloud nine. And, well, and now and the priest stopped talking, you know, and I said, "Well, Father, I said I can come back tomorrow," and I thought we could go on, and he looked at me and he smiled and he said, he said, we can't go any further. He said, this book that I'm reading from, he said, is the book that the missionaries were carrying in the 1600s when 
when, when, when the country was just being, you know, settled. And uh, he said, we can't go no further, you know. And, uh, well, but, and, and way back at when, when Silas Rice's um, daughter got married, well, it, but he, he was married twice. So when I, well, when I got in the, my car and went back to my sister's, you would think that somebody had given me a million dollars. I was so tickled to think that I, I you know, found all this out, and I never thought I could find anything That's out. That's beautiful. And, uh, and I, but then when I got home, and I, my sister said, where have you been today? Because she always asked me, because I, I go roaming around when I'm up there. I visit older people. And uh, back then, they were older. You know, now I'm the older. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I, so I said, well, I said, I can't tell you everything right now because I said, there's something that's, I don't know if it's, I'll tell you tomorrow. And she, didn't know, she didn't know why all of a sudden I didn't, couldn't tell her something. So early in the morning I got up and I went back to the church and I rapped at the priest's door again. And, and he, I know when he came to the door that he thought, well, I thought I told her, you know, we couldn't go any further back, and here she is again. And I said, I said, Father, I said, it bothered me because Silas Rice was married twice. And I said, well, I, I want to make sure I'm, I'm descended from the one that was the, the, the right, you know, um, w wife's, uh, because it, it would have been Silas Rice's daughter, but, but you know, it mean, and I thought, well, if it's the other one, well, then I wouldn't be descended from, you know. And uh, so, so he went and had to get the book out of the safe again. And he looked it up again. And he said, no, it's the right one, because the other one had died. And, and so she didn't have children. And so it was the second wife that was, you know, Silas' wife's uh, daughter that had, you know, married. And, and uh, so I, now I, so when I thanked him, and I went home, and then I, then I sat down, and I told my sister what I had found out. All you know, and uh, well, see, they all, my family all live up there, but nobody ever did any any uh, genealogy, you know, looking up, and uh, and then and now in the last few years, I, I well I I belong to. Well, in 1971, when I found this all out, and I came when I came home, and then and I thought, how can I find out what happened in Massachusetts? I now know this little this little story, <clears throat> and so I called. Uh, oh, the lady that you, she was a teacher and she was a historian. Um, <clears throat> they lived on the end of John Street. She was the historian for the until she died, almost till she died. Oh, Mrs. Webster. Mrs. Webster, I called Mrs. Webster up, and I told her. I said, "Well, I found. I told her I found out this in the church records, and I said, but I said, how? Who would I write to? What could? How could I go about? Uh, and and she said, just write a letter." to what you, you told me, what you had found out, and, and just write historian, Marlboro, Massachusetts. And she said, the postmaster will get that letter, and he'll, he'll figure out who, who should get it. And about three, four days later, I got a letter from a woman, and, uh, and she, she, had, she wrote me a letter, and then told me she had enclosed, she had made a, a copy of two pages because the year before my husband died in 1967, in Westboro, Massachusetts, they had celebrated 250th year of that town. And, uh, and well, if I had known that in 1967, you, know, uh, you know, my husband and I could have gone there. But I, you know, and, uh, so now I get this letter, and then and, there, and she had taken two pages that she had copied from 
um, from the booklet that they had of their 250th, you know, I can't think of the what you, what you call 250. Uh, Anniversary. But I have the book. I have the booklet that you know. I have it you now, and uh, and but she gave me the name of another histor historian that because this uh, this lady that answered my letter was from Westboro, but no, from uh, Marlboro, but she told me to write to a lady in Westboro. And she gave me the uh, address and everything. So I wrote a letter to, her name was Rachel Deering. And she was what, about 82 years old at the time I, I, I corresponded with her. And we corresponded all, all winter. And she, she said, you know, if you could come up, you know. And so I told her I would, and, and in, in May of 1972, I drove by myself and I drove to, to near Boston. I can't believe now that I did that. <laughs> but, you know, but I, I, I must have been so brave and, and was so interested and I went there all by myself. And I got there at 10.30 at night because I didn't leave here, my home, till 2.30 <laughs> in the afternoon. And that was kind of, it wasn't very smart of me. And, uh, but I got there and and when I rapped at her door, and then I ra rang a little doorbell, and she lived over the, the, because she was sort of the caretaker of the uh, genealogy, um, you know, like the history here, you know, like uh, the way they have it here. And uh, so, well, so she made some tea for me and put, and, and and made me a sandwich, and. Uh, and, I, and the first thing I t told her was that I said, "You must get tired of people coming, coming to, to, you know, to find out who their ancestors are." And I said, and, and 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 she said, "Oh no," she said, she said, "When you wrote that letter, when when I got your first letter, she said, you were opening up the past that no one ever knew." If Silas Rice had grown, had lived and grown up, and uh, and 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 she said, you, you have you have brought back something. She said, you know that we never would have known, and uh, because the you know, historical society, you know, and uh, so the next morning, and she was on the phone, and uh, so they had me speak at the high school, and and, and then into the historical group, and. You know, I think I must have been there like four or five days that I visited her. Uh, and who then, was Silas you know, Rice that he was so famous in Marlboro, Massachusetts? Well, he he was not he was not famous, but they were the first fa family. The, his uh, his, his um, grandfather, I think, was born in 1638. His name was Edmund Rice, and and uh, so so the the you know. They were the early settlers, and uh, and Edmund so, Rice was born here in the United States. Uh, no, he was born in England, okay. and, uh, and 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 came over, and then, uh, you know, but uh, and through that, I have now I well, because I went there in 1972, and then then I went there again sometime in late 70s or not, I think it was the late 70s. A lady from, uh, well, she was a historian from, uh, oh gosh, uh, uh, just not too far from here. Um, it's, not, it's near East Aurora, but it's a small town, another small town, small village. Well, she went with me, and we drove there, the two of us, and I went to a, a, one of the reunions, and then I met more, more, more right. Uh, Rice descendants, and then two years ago, um, no, the year, three years ago, three years ago, I went again, and a friend of mine from Toronto, a retired nurse, uh, and, well, she's a lot younger than I am, so she comes down to visit me every so often. So she went with me and and did most of the driving, and. Uh, and we went to the reunion and met more, 
you know, more, more of the descendants because every year different ones come. And, and, then, and then I met, I met uh, some that were just, you know, like, I think I, I come in like the 37th generation down, you know, down. And, uh, so, and I also met a lady who lived in Tonawanda, New York. And she was she had worked she had been a school teacher and she retired and then she wrote she was a wrote for the newspaper and uh, and she saw my name in the newsletter and she called me and I got to know her and she just died about a year and a half ago and she used to write books and so she wrote a book that and put my little st my story of my being uh, you know related to her she. She always called me her cousin, and you know, so she always referred to me as her cousin. And uh, and now with the uh, computers and everything, I now have uh, they they the with the people they have found out more of my Indian ancestry. So now I have more than what was in the church. That's you know? wonderful. Yeah. Uh, uh, wow. Do you have a computer? No, no, my my son Andy does, but I don't know how to use one, okay. and and I, I I I'm afraid to try even to try to, uh, but I, I wish I could, you know. That's um, a beautiful story, Teresa. What uh, a lovely way to learn about your family. Uh, what was your Indian name? Your father's Indian name? Uh, you're asking me something. Don't remember. Mm, I, I I I know it has something. to if you want to give me my purse, I might be able to. Okay. But my Indian name is is because you know, we, we didn't have. You can see how Indian is written. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. And what is that book? Yes, I'm trying to All in Mohawk. I have another one that has his Indian name on it. Th th this is my birth certificate from the church. I know his his name has something with blue with a blue sky, but I I, I, say it, I might say the wrong the wrong name. <coughs> and and my name is. Deleuze, Kanawiosta. Wonderful. Hmm? Looks like Teresa Cork. Hmm? What? What is the name on there? Cook. Cook? It's, yeah, my maiden name was, my father's name was Charles, Charles Cook. Hmm. And then, and then later on, later on, I also found out that my my great grandfather on my mother's side was from Scotland. So, so I have, you know, and uh, but but that's as far as I know know, know with that, you know. Uh, um, but. Do you have any memories of Akron? One particular. <laughs> Well, I I guess I have I have a, a, a lot of good me memories of the people that have lived and g gone from here, uh, and and now when I come to town, I ride by all the houses of the people that I met in the 52 years I have lived here, 
so many of them are gone. And, and I never fail when I'm going back, and I always look up Eckerson and look over to where Ransom Eckerson used to live. And, but there's so, you know, so, so many, well, because my children started to school here, I remember all the teachers, uh, and I remember the stores that were on downtown, and now they're all gone. Uh, it's, it's, I, I know people say progress is nice, but I guess uh, sometimes for some of us it isn't that great because now the, when you used to go in the stores years ago, you went in and, and people came over to you and they went and got the things for you and, and if you wanted to try something on, they would help you to try it on and, and, and now when I go in a clothing store, I have to look for the things myself, and, and I, there's no one for me to say, how does it look, or, you know, uh, the, and, and sometimes if they weren't busy, you visited with them. Now, the, the people that work in the stores don't have any time to visit with anybody, and, uh, but they're, and I guess, um, oh, I, uh, you know, and uh, well, I guess when my you know when my husband was alive, we we did we did a lot more. I I belonged to the Order of Eastern Star here in Akron. I was I when I joined, and uh, and Mr. Eckerson's mother was the first matron of the Order of Eastern Star, and and I was matron in 1963, 64, and. Uh, and that was something great. And I also forgot that I had a foreign exchange student in 1964, because my son, because he, correct? yeah, from, from Edinburgh, Scotland. And then I went there in 1972 to meet and stayed with his father and mother for a month. Mo Ian Thompson and, and Ian, Still to this day, last no in November, he called me on my birthday, and he's called me from Scotland, and then he was here in January, he stopped in to visit me. And, and I've been to the Holy Land, and I've been to, you know, saw quite a bit there, and I've been to, I've been to England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland, well, thanks for coming. It's been a really nice pleasure meeting you. Well, you're you're welcome, and well, I hope that you you know, enjoyed my oh yeah uh, because you know I I guess sometimes when people do things you don't always think this, you know are people enjoy that you're telling them you know your life story uh, uh but uh. So I, you know, I hope it helped you in your it schooling. Was fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>